Hello, I'm Hamish Bowles, and I'm delighted to be joining you today to bring you a very special Life in Looks celebrating the enduring style of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Here she is with her younger sister, Princess Margaret, of course. Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret are wearing um, glittering gold tissue fancy dress here, but in everyday life they were they were dressed in identical clothes. That was the fashion in uh, upper class circles at that point. They would have these sprigged liberty print dresses and stiff little coats. And in Scotland they'd wear kilts with a sort of twin set that picked out the brightest colour in the tartan of the of the kilts. Ah, fast forward to young Princess Elizabeth in 1947 in the white uh, drawing room of the State Apartments at Buckingham Palace, announcing her engagement. I believe she's wearing a dress here by Edward Molyneux. The bows were a sort of girlish indulgence, I think. Ah, well, here we have the Queen on her actual wedding day, of course. It's an extraordinary dress designed by Norman Hartnell, who was one of the leading London couturiers at the time. Here he was inspired by Botticelli's celebrated painting Primavera. And what he's done, which is rather marvellous, is that the dress, which is a stiff ivory duchess satin, has these little cutouts of blossoms. And those cutouts are taken out of the fabric and appliqued onto the tulle veil, which has ears of wheat for prosperity and suggestion of fecundity, dare I say. The Botticelli effect is slightly mitigated by the rather stiff quarterback shoulders, but this is 1947 and London couture hadn't quite caught up with Dior's very new-fledged new look. They had the example of uh, Wallace Simpson, who of course had um, absconded with <laughs> King Edward VIII and forced them into this position that they hadn't exactly been trained for or were expecting and gave them a sort of wariness of ever looking too fashionable or chic. So of course Britain at this point was emerging from the cataclysmic Second World War. There was still fabric rationing and young women all across Britain sent in their their ration books so that the Queen could have the fairy tale wedding dress that they might have wished for for themselves. This is the Queen um, on her coronation day. You know, her, her father had died very young. For the dress, uh, Norman Hartnell wanted to take the flower emblems um, of the four countries that make up. Great Britain, and he was rather disappointed to discover that it was a leak for Wales. So he he lobbied that one, and eventually they could substitute the leak for a daffodil. Here we are at uh, Buckingham Palace, and this is a really this was a study in contrasts. Of course, you have President Kennedy and uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, the First Lady. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy is wearing uh, a copy of a Givenchy dress by Chez Ninon, which was the a high-end, line-for-line uh, New York uh, establishment that copied haute couture Parisian dresses. So, of course, she could be wearing French style in principle, but, of course, flying the American flag so she could have her cake and eat it. The Queen, by contrast, is dressed more sort of pragmatic and less kind of theatrical. Oh, that's fun. This is... Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, she must be at a Royal Variety performance. She's about to be introduced to Gracie Fields. I think that is on the left. And of course, she's in full Norman Hartnell splendor. Again, you see this kind of starburst embroidery. She's gone a little bit daring with a sort of puffball hem. And some of you eagle-eyed royal watchers and fashionistas might recognize that this is a dress that was fashionably upcycled by Princess Beatrice on her wedding. She'd asked her grandmother if she could borrow a dress and this is the one that they settled on elegantly transformed and of course it was a wonderful gesture of course a great homage to her grandmother and um, a lovely sort of timeless wedding dress in fact oh yes here we have the queen uh, side saddle for the trooping of the color and of course so so much of the queen's wardrobe in fact perhaps all of it is in a way, considered a uniform. The military uniforms that she wears are in, enshrined in historic precedent. 
Ah, here we have the Queen in 1969, clearly not embracing London in the swinging 60s. She's um, at a meal with Princess Anne and Prince Charles and her husband. This is a still from a BBC documentary, which was the initiative of Prince Philip. He thought it would sort of humanise the royal family to let British television in to film their lives. In fact, I think the royal family worked better shrouded in mystery and mystique because they were revealed as a somewhat ordinary family um, living in an extraordinary way. I, I've just um, noticed that rather marvellous Stubbs painting on the wall behind them at breakfast. Here we are at Balmoral in Scotland, um, where the Queen goes um, every summer for holiday. And I think she's much more in her element here in traditional riding clothes, of course, and the silk headscarf that she's made so iconic. Goodness me. This is the Queen um, in 1976 at the Royal Ascot races. This is the one occasion where the Queen feels free to sort of embrace fashion up to a point. She's sort of embracing a style statement, I guess, with these sort of uh, flame red accents. Perhaps not her finest sartorial hour. Here's the Queen on beaming form with her corgis. She has to be always uh, visible in the crowd and, you know, she's a uh, diminutive stature and the solution that her couturiers came up with, which is a brilliant one, is that she would be in a really singing colour and a dramatic hat in the same colour, so that even in a, a crowd of hundreds of or thousands of people, she's going to stand out as this little kind of beacon of colour in the middle of them all. I was very struck, there was an incredible exhibition of the Queen's clothes at Buckingham Palace, and they'd been arranged in this sort of rainbow of shades dozens and dozens of ensembles and you saw that really she's she's sort of worn everything apart from perhaps grey and beige. This is the Queen in 1988 at the Trooping of the Colour with Princes Harry and William of course on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. What you don't see here is that the room they're coming out of is an incredible room filled with um, Chinese inspired treasures that were designed for George IV and came from Brighton Pavilion, a sort of fanciful house on the English coast that that monarch used to retreat to in the early 19th century. And here, of course, the Queen in a sort of a, a very strident shade of kind of slightly turquoise blue. And of course, you know, the moment she steps out on the onto the balcony, she's going to be immediately recognisable. Wow, this is Her Majesty really going for it. This is the Royal Variety performance in 1999, and she's certainly giving us a bit of variety here. It's a, it's a very unusual choice, uh, because of course, what, we're, what we've seen for decades is this sort of head-to-toe solid color look, so suddenly to have this kind of harlequin effect is rather splendid, I think, and totally unexpected. Oh, I love this shot. This is an unusual candidate of the Queen sort of cracking up because um, her husband has to stand to attention, of course, in his uniform um, in the presence of his monarch. And again, you know, yet another strident turquoise blue and the hat, of course, matched exactly to the colour of the coat. And the fabric used for the binding of the collar has been used um, in greater amplitude for the upper brim of the hat. And again, you know, if you look at images of Princess Elizabeth as a young girl, she's wearing coats that look pretty much exactly like this. So from the beginning, the monarch has worked with her couturiers and in this instance milliners to create clothes that are a complement to the host nation on her global tours. She knew there was going to be a photo op in front of the iconic Sydney Opera House and you can see that the hat has been designed to complement just that. 
This is the Queen back in the white drawing room at Buckingham Palace. Here she is um, in the extraordinary inky blue silk velvet cape of the Order of the Garter, worn over a figured sort of matelassé damask evening gown and looking every inch the Queen. Endless portraits and of course the Queen has sat to famous artists from um, Pietro Anagoni to Lucian Freud, photographers from Cecil Beaton, Norman Parkinson, and in this instance, uh, Annie Leibovitz, who's really continued that tradition of this sort of very imposing state portrait. You know, this is absolutely a defining image of the monarch. Oh my goodness me, I remember this moment. It was absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. This was the then very young designer, Richard Quinn's um, fashion show during London Fashion Week. There were three seats at the end of the runway, just where the girls would be coming out, that had been reserved. And they were being very, very jealously guarded. I couldn't help but notice. <laughs> anyway, there was this absolutely electrifying moment when we'd all sat down. I think there might even have been a Tannoy announcement asking us to sit down and, you know, which is standard in a fashion show that's about to start. So we all sat down and then, quite incredibly, <laughs> the Queen appeared. Her Majesty was about to present the inaugural Queen Elizabeth II Award for British Design, which is why she was there. Richard was going to be the recipient and I, I, <laughs> I just cannot tell you how electrifying it was to be in this room and she walks in and you know there's this incredible aura and magnetism exuded because because of who she is and her role and one's respect for her so it was quite incredible she sat down next to Anna Winter I remember Richard Quinn had done this incredible collection that was all these different sort of 1950s scarf prints morphed onto a kind of Lee Bowery perform 80s performance artist sort of idea the Queen um I believe did admire some of the prints. This is Her Majesty in 2021, attending a polo match at Windsor. Now that I think about it, it's quite extraordinary because it really is exactly what she was wearing as a young girl. You know, the flower sprigged dress, the very formally tailored um, A-line coat, um, unbelted, a, a, a matching hat that's been very carefully and scrupulously colour coordinated to match the ensemble. Here we have the, this unusually heartwarming image of Her Majesty the Queen, of course, celebrates one of her very great passions. She is surrounded by two of her beloved fell ponies. There's symbolism in the Queen's clothes, which of course are often designed symbolically to convey messages, even in this informal photograph. She's wearing a coat of Edinburgh green, the colour of her late husband, Prince Philip's livery, and thus, of course, a very resonant and personal and poignant choice. If there's something we can all learn from Her Majesty the Queen, it's perhaps this idea of fi finding a style that works for you very early on and sticking with it. It's been an absolute joy to revisit Her Majesty's lifetime in, in looks, and I want to express my appreciation for her contribution to the job and to style. <laughs>